Welcome to the Slide Gittins Tech Simplified channel. And today I have her for me, Evelyn Zabo. She is a great guest. She's going to sit here and share her story and how she got started in IT and how she's continued to thrive in IT. So I definitely want you to lock into the end of this video because she will be dropping some great career gems and insights. So Evelyn, would you mind letting my audience know a little bit more about yourself and how you got started and your background? Sure, I'm happy to. First, thanks for having me. I've really been looking forward to doing this with you, so appreciate the opportunity. Um, my background is very, uh, I'll say, traditional in the sense that when I went to college, I wanted to be a business major, so I took the opportunity in those days to go through the computer science as a minor, and I never really thought about the fact that I would be using that as my lifetime career um, model. So when I first came into the workforce, I started in banking. So when I left the bank, I found that I wanted to work for a company where IT was what they did, was their primary focus. And so I went to work for a great company who gave a good training baseline about all the aspects of technology that would be useful for me, not only in that role, but in roles to come started out on the technical side, but what I quickly found out that my expertise was really better suited to that translation between what the technology could provide and what the customer really needed. And so that became my really sweet spot of technology. And then once I'd mastered those areas, then I went into sales. And that was really where I found my you know, place in the career path. I was able to make uh, customers understand how they could use the technology, the services of the company that I was working with to really accelerate them, not only to fix problems, but really to take advantage of opportunities either in the market or things that differentiated them. Great. That's, that's fantastic. So uh, let's just talk about that. So how is your education helping you today in your role? And did you think it was necessary to have it? And um, what would you share? What would you like people to know? I just want to kind of unpack and how is it sure. continue to help you? Yeah, first of all, I'm a huge believer in education. And when we talk about um, giving back to the community, education is one of the three areas that I focus my, I'll say nonprofit or philanthropic uh, work on. And I'm a huge believer that women in technology is one of the greatest opportunity areas. And I think people sometimes get a little bit confused or they get uh, dissuaded from using a technology career path because they see it only as programming, which is what a lot of people know. But the reality is there are a plethora of jobs within the technology field that are technical or semi-technical, and some that are frankly not very technical at all, where you just need to know a little bit about how things work, but not such uh, deep technical skills. So I always encourage women, I always say it's one of the highest paying job career paths. It's uh, got great opportunity. And frankly, there are a lot of women uh, becoming more senior in that field than in any other field um, uh, similar to that, right? You don't often see uh, engineering or something like construction or something like that having so many opportunities for women, but they should. But uh, IT definitely has the opportunities for women. So for the the question itself, the idea of going to school was a key for me because it gave me a baseline understanding of not only what one does in computer science at the time, that's what it was called, but also how customers use it, right? So it wasn't really just all about being a developer and it was how people would apply that information. So that's why I liked the combination of being both a business major as well as an IT uh, minor, because as I'd go through a marketing class, I'd see how technology, particularly run data and analytics, could help. If yeah. you went through a finance class, obviously some of the advantages of using, you know, high performance computing to calculate, you know, financial options and things like that. So every business course that I took was really tightly woven together with information technology. And for me, I see that happening in every field. I don't care what field, health and life sciences, retail, um, financial, it, it, all of these fields are uh, really dependent on technology. So no matter where your interest is, having a good foundation of technology is important. And I believe that 
even if you do that in now in high school or grade school, <laughs> um, through college and through maybe a master's program and whatever, anytime you can get a technology uh, focus around your education, it's great. And I always tell people, I always say, if you look at who um, moves in their career to become the CEO, they often have a financial um, background and a technology background right? And a business background. But really, those two uh, disciplines of finance and, and technology are key contributors to who becomes um, in the leadership ranks. And I, I think you touched on a, a perfect point, because I had a similar experience in my educational path. Mm -hmm. So I started off as an English major, then I switched over into business. And then when I took business, I also took my marketing classes where I found that mm -hmm. I enjoyed them. So I ended up taking a marketing concentration. Then I took my first tech class and I found out I, I've always been good with computers, just never put two and two to go to school right. for it at the time. Right. So I ended up doing both of them. Tech classes showed me how to be analytical, how to solve problems using technology. Marketing told me how to understand who's your customer. How do you right. get the product to them? How can you use technology to help you make better decisions on how you market? And then also, the and at the University of Buffalo, I took uh, is a business administration is your major and those mm -hmm. are your two concentrations. So you had your finance classes, your operation classes, your project management classes to so show me how a business works. So you can kind of figure out how to leverage it. And to be honest with you, I use that today. This is marketing. Right. I'm marketing my brand, but I'm using technology to do it. Right. Even mm -hmm. my job as an engineer during the day is a little bit of marketing, sales and business. But then it's also technical because I ask you got to sell the solutions or architect the solution and demonstrate the solutions. Um, so, again, it, it helps me in all my life and even different facets. Even when I'm just with my daughter and the way we learn and interact now, mm -hmm. I can use those skill sets. So I definitely agree with you that education, as long as you're curious, it doesn't right. hurt, man. Because uh, one thing for me is I'm going to keep learning so I can't learn anymore physically, right? because I feel like that's how we continue to grow. And any way you could get some more IT, I mean, it won't hurt you. And if you're not good at, I'm not good at coding. I'm gonna be honest, I'm not a software developer, but I right. understand it, but I don't do that on a day-to-day -day basis, right? Mm -hmm. um, do I think I should know a little bit more about it? I think it wouldn't hurt. Um, and I think it would, it would help me, but I don't need to in my role. And there's a lot of roles that don't require that as well. So right. I'm glad that you and pointed that out. Yeah, and I would uh, echo you. I was a double major. I was an English major as well. And I think that when I tell people that I was an English major and a business major, I said, I really wanted to combine my love of reading and writing. And I said, that has also helped me as an educational path. Uh, I'll tell a quick funny story. I went through a technical training program with the first company that I, that I hired into for a technology career. And they sent a group of us to a, a remote location and they looked around and they said, look to your left, look to your right. One of those people are not going to be here at the end of the 10 week training because it was so intense. And there were, I think, um, let's say 95% men in the course who were mostly all computer science majors. And then myself and another woman, she was an, uh, um, anthropology major, and I was a business English major. And so all the gentlemen <laughs> looked at us, assuming that we would be the ones that would not be here at the end of the 10 weeks. She graduated number one in the course. I graduated number two because we followed the directions. We didn't assume that we knew everything. We said, okay, tell us the best way for us to do this program. We'll work hard at it. And obviously, we were smart enough to be able to get the technical concepts. And I think people look at the liberal arts and say they won't make good technical folks, but the reality is they make great technical folks because they have the discipline of the English majors have the ability to, to listen to concepts and turn them into reality. Um, you know, all, all of the arts really are great technical folks if they choose, right? Yeah. So I think it, it's a misnomer to think you have to go into a technical discipline to be successful in a technical career. Yeah. And I agree. Opinion. And if anyone who listening to this, and if you're on the fence, if you think you are don't have the skill set currently, I always like to use currently because right. you can always change that.
we all had different backgrounds, but I think that what makes us unique. And that's the great thing with technology. If you're willing to learn the technology, um, it's up to you to brand yourself in a way that makes you different. So when you come up to an interview, especially right now during COVID, where a lot of people are unemployed. Right. So now that this is more of a, you know, a employer's job market because they have more candidates to choose. Mm -hmm. How do you show up different? And um, I don't say that to intimidate you. It's just to talk about your background. And if you don't have a background that you don't think is that compelling, how can you do it at home? Are you taking any LinkedIn learning classes? Are you taking any um, online training, whether that be from edX or even Harvard or Stanford has free training mm -hmm. to get online, YouTube University, I like to call. Um, you can write all these things down. You can create small projects for yourself and use that as something to create a portfolio. You can even create a portfolio page, mm -hmm. uh, making a website. You don't even know how to code. You can go to Wix, take a template, write some information right. in there, and there you go. You have an online brand. You can make a YouTube channel like I have here where mm -hmm. you can show off some skills set that you have or show off your expertise that you're learning. And if you can bring a following, companies will pay for that following. Right? right, because if you can bring that and then explore it to the company, so don't sell yourself short. I think that's one thing we're trying to say here. And each educational experience is unique. Just figure out how can that be your differentiator. And if you don't currently have the skills that you need for the role that you're envisioning, just ask some right. questions. Find the right people. You know, reach and out. Start start that's the thing right and i think people are they think diversity but they don't always think diversity of approach or thought yeah. and the idea is that if you are a critical thinker if you have the ability to look at an issue and bring something of yourself to solve or or take advantage of an opportunity that's great right um start with your social media presence as you mentioned right but the idea is that start right? Yeah. Practice, take a course, do something interesting. I think that most of us think we have to be able to be masters of it right at the beginning, but the reality is nobody started that way, right? Correct. I started out very young in my knowledge, if you will, about technology, and it's only through many years, right, where I've gone through these technology waves where I can look back at them and see what those trends and and things were telling me about what's coming today right mm -hmm. what is what is new today has um direct uh relevance from what has come before right and just being around long enough <laughs> you know enables me to look back and and be able to make some prediction towards where the where the technology market is growing and where it's mm -hmm. going so all very interesting so let's right? switch into the another next sure and is what advice would you give yourself um, early on in your career. And the reason why I'm asking this question, mm -hmm. the primary, my primary audience is between the ages of 18 to 25. Oh, great. Uh, so, or, and also we starting to bleed into the 35. So like 18 to that 35 range. Right? 35 is the new 25. We've heard that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so like, what would you, t what, what advice would you give yourself, Evelyn? Absolutely. Um, I think there's three things. One is we've talked a little bit about this is that don't be um, thrown off by the fact that you're not technical already, right? If you explore the area of technology, even if it's taking, as you say, some courses, some looking at YouTube videos, as long as you can begin to learn to speak the language a little bit and take some uh, understanding of what the issues are in the technology realm today. Technology changes so quickly. People who are experts today will not be experts in five years or maybe even three years. And so it's a little bit like um, like surfing. You just need to catch your wave, right? Doesn't mean you need to master everything that has come before. So jump in, right? Basically jump in the pool and start learning about what is available today. And then as you gain proficiency. Um, the second thing I would say is that try your hand at both uh, what I call the technical, we, we traditionally refer to those as the delivery side of the house. So in other words, deliver projects, manage a project, and then try and sell the project. Because one of the things that makes you a great delivery person is having sold something and the reverse. So when you've been, and I'm sure we've all had this experience, that somebody has clearly sold a project, they've never done anything relevant towards that project, and they've sold something that is either not doable or not feasible or not desirable at the end of the day. And I think as our younger um, 
uh, people come up through technology, there's a tendency for people to get siloed into very narrow roles. And the goal is to try and broaden that right, is to say, even if it's just to volunteer, to say, oh, yes, I would be happy to step outside my current role and maybe project manage a volunteer activity over in another area, or I'll do a special project in marketing, or I'll do a special project in whatever, HR or finance, so that you learn a little bit more about all the different areas of the company and how they use technology. And I think that is one thing that I cannot emphasize enough, which is to volunteer. Every great project I've ever gotten into started out with somebody saying, we need somebody to go to XYZ location to do XYZ project. And everybody sat there and went, mm, do I want to go there? Do I want to work on that project? Do I know anything about that? And I thought, well, shoot, it's not like any of us are going to be experts. I'm going to raise my hand. And off it's taken me both into more interesting areas, more executive visibility, which I know is important for people younger in their careers, and the ability to learn something new, which as you say, I might be catching the next wave. We don't know, right? Yeah. So the goal is that I wanted to always stay interested in what I was doing. And so I always was very um, thoughtful about moving myself forward. And if I could give um, general <laughs> guidance to people is don't uh, or be less afraid, right? I want to be more positive. Be more positive. Be less afraid and say, I want to speak up. And particularly, I speak to people who are maybe in a room where everybody seems to be more senior or maybe has more of a, an opinion, which is speak up. Even if it is not 100% the right thing to say, you need to get your voice out there so that you start practicing that. I used to be very nervous doing presentations and people said, well, how did you overcome that? I said, I did lots and lots of presentations and it's like anything. I'm sure the first ones were not as good and then they got better. And the idea is that anything you practice now, I don't even think very hard about, you know, people say, do you want to do this? Sure. I'm happy to do this. Right. So I had no, um, uh, trepidation to come forward and do this uh, podcast with you because I have presented, I'm passionate about this topic, and I feel like m my ability to share my thoughts with you and your audience is good for both me, you, and them. And so I always feel that raising your hand and volunteering, speaking out, right, just a few moments, right, get get your voice heard at the table. I always encourage people to both sit literally at the table, which we may do someday again in non-COVID times, but sit at the table, put your hand out there, or put your voice out there to say, I, I have something to contribute. Even if you're shy or um, sort of more of an introvert, you need to push yourself. It's, it, your contribution can be the difference maker, but no one will know it unless you give that contribution. Yeah, great advice. Definitely agree with that. Um, one thing I would like to ask you is someone asked me the other day is, and it comes off of what you just said, when you put your hand up and ask for that new project, mm -hmm. it's taking off. It, it, it feels like it's taking me away from the specialization that I want to focus on. Mm -hmm. So what I find is sometimes when I'm talking to younger folks, even, even people my age, they think it's linear. linear. Like if I'm right. a you know, junior network engineer, I become a network engineer, then become a senior network engineer, then I might go somewhere else. Did you, have you seen that? What's your thoughts on that by any chance? Well, I think it depends on where you are in your cycle, right? In your career cycle and maybe even in your age cycle. When I first came into the workforce, the expectation is that you would work 20 or 30 years at one company and that was it, except for in IT. IT was unique even in those early days because people switched around. You move from maybe every three years or so from one company or one role to another role within your company or to a different company. And so I was used to that. And I think at that time, it was really the rise of consulting as well, which in and of itself was perfect for someone like myself because every whatever period of time, you had the opportunity to move to a new client, a new project, a new industry, a new technology. The inherently change was built into the consulting cycle. And there are a number of companies that are like that. It doesn't always have to be consulting companies. 
for me, I look at this and, you know, I read the stories about where they say things are going, that people will have multiple careers in their lifetime, maybe three to five hugely different careers. So I look at what someone is doing and saying, I want to develop a balance between mastery and uh, broad reach. Because if what I do no longer becomes relevant in my industry, um, then maybe I have pigeonholed myself into, into a narrow place that isn't a good fit for me for a long, sustained career. And so I look at it and I say, I want to develop mastery. I don't want to skip from one thing to the next to the next just because. I think it depends on where you are. If you have an area of specialization, maybe it's around one industry, then the opportunity is to develop that expertise and then add other areas. The second would be around a technology, for example, to develop that expertise and then add other technologies to that. The third is around geography. If you have the opportunity, work with other groups outside of, for example, North America, if that's where you're based. Give the opportunity to both work with international uh, as well as potentially go to international locations. So the idea is that broaden your horizons. If you've been in finance, try something in marketing. If you've been in marketing, try something over in engineering, right? All of these things will help broaden your both career interests, but also your relevance. So when an area gets, for example, downsized or shifted to another um, practice area, then you have the opportunity, as you said, to move laterally versus getting laid off if that's what, you know, if that's what ha ends up happening, right? I don't want to scare people, but I think the broadest thing, the broadest platform that you can have makes you better uh, a fit for a broadest variety of, of roles. And if you're interested in a variety of things like I was, that's a great opportunity right? So I don't really see people doing these long, long careers. Narrow specialization works for some people. There's certain professions that reward that. The IT profession doesn't really. It gives you the ability to really move from one area of expertise to another in a very seamless way. Yep. I do tell people um, that early in your career, sometimes it's easier to know what you don't want to do than what you absolutely want to do. You'll come to the what you want to do over multiple years in, in an industry or in a, in a firm or in a technology. But sort of weeding out what you don't want to do. And I remember telling the story, at, I was speaking at a, at a university, mm -hmm. and they said, well, tell me how you figured out what you wanted to do. And I said, I started to make a note of the things that I didn't like to do. So for example, I wanted to work a normal Monday to Friday type of a job. And at the, at the end, I said, so I didn't go in, in into any kind of a career that required you to work in the evenings or at night or on the weekends or be on call or something. And I said, it's amazing how just knowing that I didn't want to do something as simple as that meant that I could cross off a bunch of <laughs> kind of career choices. And then the other thing I said is I want to be in a business where even though I work with technology, I want to work with people. I want to work in teams because I said I really enjoy the interaction. And I said that created a little bit of a, a focusing. And then finally I said I like to solve problems. And for me, the larger the problem and the more complicated and complex it is, those are the kind of problems that I like to solve over a long period of time. There's people who wanna solve problems that are very, like there's a right and wrong answer. Great, that's not me. And so by doing that, what I was able to do is really be clear about what my career focus would be. And then I just applied that to the type of roles that I was interviewing for. I said, these are the kind of parameters that I have. And that takes a while to get you know, people to understand that about themselves. But that's what I encourage people, as opposed to saying, I do or don't like to be a Python programmer, right? Yeah. That's okay. If you like programming, you can learn another language. If you don't like programming, it doesn't matter how many languages you learn, you're not going to like them, right? right. It's not going to like, not going to make programming any better for you. So I tell people to kind of take a step back and see what it is in its essence that helps guide you. That's, that was great. I don't have anything to add on that. I think you knocked it out <laughs> of the park. That was a home run. You just knocked it out. There you go. Um, it, is, it is the World Series right now. <laughs> you know, so that's why I had to put it there, right? It was just right, right on target. So that helped us get me into our next question. 
what obstacles did you have to overcome to get you where you were today? Right. Um, it's hard for people who know me now to believe I was very shy um, through high school. And one of the first things I did when I went to college was I said, this being shy is not going to help me. And I'm sure those first few years were very clunky as I moved to being more of an extrovert. And I know that's easy to say, but it was very challenging for me to move from being shy to not being so shy, right? But I found that to get what I wanted out of my life is I needed to be more um, assertive in my communications, right? And be more outgoing and, and such. So I was always confident and positive, but I needed to add that little bit of assertiveness into it. And I think if I look at the obstacles, you know, there was always this inherent uh, issue of that in in my day, which sounds makes me sound older than I want to say I am, but is that women were either the secretaries or the sort of bad boss kind of thing, right? There was sort of this no middle ground, right? There was the nice women who were the helpers and the secretaries and those kind of things in white collar jobs. And then there were the people who were, you know, either the, if they were in management, they really had kind of a very fierce uh, reputation. And I never understood. I thought, I don't want to be either of those extremes. And technology was still a relatively new, and in my mind, still still new enough uh, industry where I could carve a different path. So that was part of the attraction of technology and why I didn't go into some of the other, the other choices. So as an obstacle, it was I wanted to be in an industry that was new enough where I didn't need 30 years of experience to be confident and credible as an expert, and technology provided that. The other side, which of course probably goes maybe without saying, is that being young and female wasn't always conducive for really holding these very serious technical discussions. Mm -hmm. So when I was young in my career, I moved into um, uh, warehousing for a very large company. And the idea was I wrote the systems behind how the warehouse ran, right? Purchasing and uh, how you chose where to put things in a warehouse and those kind of uh, systems. And so then I moved into sales and they said, well, you know a lot about warehousing, right? And I said, sure do. And I said, and they said, we'd like you to sell in, in the uh, rest belt, as we fondly call it, the, the part of the country from Michigan to Texas, right? And I would make an appointment and these people who are out in these warehouses would just look at me and kind of shake their head like, what is this 25-year-old going to tell us about warehousing? And so the first thing I had to do in every sales call for the first, you know, couple of years was prove that I knew something about the topic. So I really did take the opportunity, learned a lot about warehousing and the first thing I do is I talk to them about what was happening in their warehouse. I talk to them about what some pros and cons were of the way they were doing some things. And I said, I'm open to hearing your side of it. And only later did I get into the conversation about what I was doing there, what I was there to sell. Because the reality was, unless I established my credibility, they were not going to listen to me. They just, you know, they were excited to see who was, who was going to show up. And that was it. And I knew that I would never get the sales. I would get the sales call, but I'd never get the business. So I needed to find that, meet them in a place where they could convince themselves and their team that they were doing business with a company and a person that was credible. The story is people buy from people they like, but they have to find them credible. Right. Yeah. And that was the first thing. You know, technology was more open. I'm sure there were, you know, many of points in time where I was overlooked because I was young and female and not an expert in every topic. But I had the self-confidence to say, I may not be an expert, but I'm not sure there are that many experts in every topic. So I'm going to find the places where I can have a demonstrated expertise and bring that value to my company and for myself. And I, I think you touched on a lot of great gems there. I just want to unpack a few of them. Is um, when, when I first started, um, I was in pre-sales and, and I was in mm -hmm. tech support. And as you know, tech support, the phone rings, right? right. You, you just got to pick it up. And it's just like a call center, up and down, up and down. So I made mm -hmm. the switch to sales. 
And when mm-hmm. I went to sales, the phone didn't ring. I'm like, well, how do I make it ring? <laughs> you know, like, you know, I think it's a simple thing. I'm like, well, what do I do? I need to call them. So let me call, call them. I'm like, right. phone hung up on me. Right. And then I realized I had a sales team that I didn't manage, but I indirectly mm-hmm. needed them to help me hit my number. Right. And I had, had seven, about 65 reps. That was, mm-hmm. But I was only 24 at the time. Mm-hmm. And all my reps were either 30 to 60. Right. So when they saw me coming, they're like, how can you help me with my accounts? A, they didn't find me credible. They didn't think I knew what I was talking mm-hmm. about. And B, they just saw me as a tech person. They're like, well, how right. can you do sales with your tech? I'm like, but after a while, after I got to know these people, I created mm-hmm. profiles about them. I called them. I had them lead me into an account and watch me for the first time around. Mm-hmm. And I realized, depending on the person personality, how much leeway they would give me. Some people love control mm-hmm. and they need to see it. Some mm-hmm. people didn't. It was like, hey, Sly, you saw you do it once. We trust you. You can have it in there. But you're right. I took a long, it took me a little bit to understand that I didn't talk about me. I wanted to learn mm-hmm. about them, what's their comfort level, what is driving them. Because I found the people who were restrictive on their accounts just had a lot of stuff writing on this account, right. and their personal life, and that's what's causing them to be this way. Mm-hmm. And then once I figure out what was driving that, I can help that. Like I created like contests to compete, to make my three departments compete against each mm-hmm. other, figure out who's the best, actually increase the most revenue from doing right. it. Right. Um, it, it was funny. So and then um, so I, I say that just to echo on that is that um, you got to be OK in a situation that you might not be the most. I knew I wasn't the best salesperson because right. my first sales job, but mm-hmm. they didn't want me to be. But I was an expert on VMware. Mm-hmm. That one thing I could help them with. They didn't need to go anywhere else but me. I could be an expert on that. And that since I was technical, I would deploy it. I could do the pre-sales and the sales. So I didn't right. need an engineer. I just did it myself. Right. Right, so it was and the fast. customer loves that usually, right? Because yeah. it's one-stop shopping. So that was perfect, right? So just to echo on that, and um, some some similar for me. When you mostly when I started, I didn't see as many African Americans in these mm-hmm. technical roles. Well, in my classes, I was the only an African American mm-hmm. in my roles. So it was very disheartening. So going in there and then this establishing myself, I would go out to these field meetings, and they would go talk to my sales rep who was an African-American and say, they start asking them technical questions. And my sales rep like, well, I ain't the smart guy on the team. He is. Right. right. And they look at me like, okay. You know, so mm-hmm. I already know that I have to prove myself in a way in those situations, but I don't use that as something to discourage me. I'm just going to show you what I know. Right. And I, I'm the first person when you do a demo or a presentation with me, you got, I say there's going to be a lot of smart people and you're going to ask me a question. I don't know. The one thing I can promise you, I'm going to tell you I don't know and get you that answer before the end of this call or even after this call. And then once I set that precedence, most tech people understand you can't know it all, right? Right. Respect, respect is game that way, right? But then right. when I ask particular questions, you can go into details and the nuances. Uh, but you're right. Um, not to back down, being able to just stay calm, understand mm-hmm. the situation, understand the people in the situation, and that helps you um, just make better decisions and thrive in those those types of situations. Right. And it's not an obstacle unless you think it is, right? I mean, True. part yeah. of it is if you come prepared, if you come with something to offer, if you come with a positive attitude, most people, not everybody, I don't want to live in the in the unreal world, but most yeah. people will give you a chance. They will let you prove yourself. Mm-hmm. And that's the ones, you know, the other ones you don't even want to need to spend your time with, right? It's the ones who are willing to give you a chance. And you did what I did, which was I essentially made myself credible. And then I would go out there and I knew they were all the, you know, whatever jokes or whatever you want to say about a woman in warehousing. I mean, there was never any women out in the warehouse, right? Except yeah. for me. And I, but I knew that was my job and I was going to be good at it. And that was part of it too, right? Is that you know that you can't do everything in one, uh, you know, one dash that sometimes it takes a while and you just need to be able to sustain yourself and say, I will get through this because I'm smart, I'm talented. And I want to say that to to younger people in their careers or to people young in their careers, I should say, which is even if you're making a crossover from one Um, career to another, give it a try. I didn't get here overnight and neither will anyone else. And good for them if they do, but everyone needs to go through the learning process. And I think you you set up the next question really well is you obviously had success in your career. 
So how did you prepare for interviews and mm -hmm. how did you get what you were worth? Because time and time again, we read these reports and they show the comparison for men and women um, and men usually out earn. And I like to, to challenge that because I know a lot mm -hmm. of women who make four times as much as I do and they deserve it because they work their tail off. And the same thing, I know a lot of men that don't make that much either, right? So, mm -hmm. and, and everything in between, I feel like sometimes in society we focus on the fringe outlook, right? Um, but how did you get what mm -hmm. you were worth what would you recommend for someone mm -hmm. right now, even if they, it's their first job, how can they ask for more? How should they ask for more? Sure. And how do they sell their value? I think that's mm -hmm. the big thing. Well, I think the easiest thing to think about is preparing for an interview to start with. One is to make sure that people remember that it's not just about the company wanting you, but you wanting the company and thinking about how will you fit? How will you contribute to what they're trying to do? If you come to the interview prepared, you know something about the company, you know something about the role, you know something about how that role is helpful to other areas, not just the role itself, right? You want to stay out of the silo type of activity. Then I think you have a better interview experience. And truly, we say it all the time, but be authentic. Because in reality is, I have, I'm very competitive, and I have gone on interviews for jobs that I knew I didn't want, but because I wanted to win the interview process, I would get these job offers, and then I would go, I, I never wanted that job. Not at all. And so remember what's at stake here, which is not just winning the interview process, but really winning the role, winning the job. The second thing is... It, the salary side of things is very tricky to determine. And there's so many aspects that you can, can look at now online, right? There's all these uh, websites that you can look at to say what's the average amount that people are um, making in different companies and at different roles. And I encourage people to look that stuff up. The other thing too is I've traditionally always tried to find a coach or a champion within the company itself. So and it doesn't matter how, I'll say, far removed, right? If the person works there or if their friend works there, can they find out what the salary structure looks like? I once had a friend who used to work together with me. She went to a different company and I called her and said, hey, I'm interviewing at your company. She did a totally different job than what I was interviewing for. And I said, I was going to ask for X amount of money. What did she think? And she came back and said, you should ask for two X of that. Mm. And I was totally surprised. And she said, that's what people in this group are making. And she said, I'm aware of that because she did some other kind of financial analysis. And, you know, fabulous. So I asked for that amount of money. I did swallow hard when he said, really, you think that? Why do you think that? And I said, these are the three reasons. One, two, three, right? my past experience, my current experience that I can bring, you know, I had a book of business as it were that I could bring to the table. And then third, my willingness to really work and learn their organization and be a success. And they gave me that money and I would have asked for half of that and been happy. And so I always also suggest maybe take your current salary and move it up a couple of notches. Not like your line, but just when people say, well, what target range are you thinking about? Take it up a little, right? If you're making 50,000 now, maybe make that 60 or 65 when you ask, because if they come back and say it's 50, well, you're not behind, but if they say, great, 65, you've already got a promotion in terms of right. your salary increase. The other thing too is, part of it is asking for a promotion. And I think that's one of the things that people have a harder time doing. They feel like they are on a specific career path, right? You said it. I'm going to be a junior network engineer, then I'm going to be a network engineer, then I'm going to be a senior network engineer. The first thing I would do as a junior network engineer is go in and say, what does it take for me to be a network engineer. Yep. I would like to get a sponsor to help me. I would like to take the courses that are needed. I would like to get the relevant work experience so that I can get there. And what is the time frame that you think that I should be looking to make that promotion for senior engineer or, or network engineer? And then the same thing for senior network engineer so that people know you are interested in moving up. I think oftentimes, and they say this particularly about women, 
is that women say, I'm going to do good work and then I will be recognized for that and promoted. But the reality is men, and maybe do it better than, than, than others, is they go in and they say, I've got this job day one and I want to get the already the next job. That's and right. And I think, yeah, and that's great, but it, women need to be doing that as well. And people earlier in their career needs to be doing that because you want them to say, I'm aggressive and I want to make a difference and I want to move myself up. And then frankly, the money comes with that. Yeah. That's just how it works naturally. Yeah, and that, you, you touched on a lot of great points there is I have in my current role a few mentors. Um, mm -hmm. I, I expressed to my management, I want to be in management. Um, and um, I got two, two mentors that teach me how to do things. The way right. I solve problems, the way I currently structure my day is more of an engineer than a manager. Do I even know mm -hmm. what a manager does? Like, do I, can I forecast if I need to have a conversation about salary, right? Because mm -hmm. that's important to me, right? If my, my paycheck doesn't look right. important, I need to have, to have that conversation. Can I have that conversation? Do right. I want to have that conversation, right? right. I say that to, to recap everything is, you got to have um, role models and it's, mm -hmm. it's easy to have them. Or even if you can't meet them personally, just right. use LinkedIn. You said Well, a couple of comments I wanted to uh, add. One is yep. that I think we always look forward and see, you know, it used to be we'd look for mentors and now they're calling it more of a sponsor. Somebody who's really vested in making you successful as opposed to somebody. It's great to get good advice from a lot of people, which is what you're doing, right? You're bringing that forum, but it's nothing to substitute for somebody who says, hey, Sly, I'm going to take you under my wing and I'm going to help you. And that is a great thing, but you need to ask for that because it is a two-way street for most people. They need to get something out of it and you need to get something out of it. So you need to think about what you might bring to that relationship. The other thing I would say too, though, is it ne it's never too early to start. People think, oh, well, I'm too junior to be able to be a mentor or a sponsor for someone. There is always somebody who is more junior than you, typically, who would value your advice and guidance and pay it forward, take them under your wing and help them move, start moving up the channel as well. That's great. Because I go back into my university and they call it comfort coffee cup conversations. And I right. talk to the undergrads. Um, I talk to the new techs that come in mm -hmm. who give advice, right? Um, so I, I try to pay it forward because I got lucky enough to have, be blessed with an older brother who was able mm -hmm. to do it for me. So I didn't have to look too far. Right. Um, and also my sister, they also gave mm -hmm. me great advice in the beginning. So I, ca I knew how to take that advice. And now it's my turn to give back. And um, I right. think that's critical. The other, the other piece is I always tell people, think about volunteering. Think about working in a nonprofit because the reality is you have the opportunity to be in leadership much more quickly maybe than in your professional side of your role. You have the opportunity to lead people. And if you can lead people who don't get paid to show up, you can definitely lead people who get paid to show up. And that's what I always tell people is if you can gain consensus, if you can help set direction, create a, an agenda for people and champion a cause, it's great. And you get the benefit of doing something that it truly does pay forward in a nonprofit type of a situation. And so I always encourage people, it's a great opportunity to practice some of these, I'll say softer skills in particular, but also some of the more technical skills. If you don't know how to read a budget or how to um, create a technology, right, to create a Zoom meeting, all the nonprofits now need all of those kind of hard skills and soft skills. So go out, volunteer, and you'll find that you get a chance to practice those things. So then you can bring them back into your workplace as more accomplished than maybe your first time out. It's a question so. for you. How do you even do that, right? Um, how do you even engage when you just send an email randomly to somebody mm -hmm. and say, hey, I want to you know, do your technology at your non for profit Like, how does someone even start that conversation, right? Yeah, it's, it's pretty simple. Um, mostly, I reach out to the organizations that I care about, mm -hmm. or the topics or areas of interest for myself. So mine are around interest uh, with education, with women's issues, and then with the arts. And so what I've done is if I've moved, for example, to a new community, or even if I'm in a community, and I find that I have one uh, a nonprofit experience kind of coming to an end and I'm looking for another one, 
often I'll ask the people that are in the current community, hey, is there another organization that you think would benefit either from my volunteering or my board leadership or something like that? Sometimes there's money associated with that, but not always, right? And most of them, if you come with a, with a skill, there are many type of volunteer technology organizations that help other volunteer organizations. So all you have to do is a little bit of research mm -hmm. to find out. I believe in working for a cause that you're interested in because I think that's the easiest way to become um, more balanced in bringing both what I call your time and your treasure because it does take time, right? And your treasure is your skill set or your your money perhaps or whatever it is that you bring to the table. But if you want to use your time wisely, do it with something that you're interested in just makes more sense to me. But yes, yeah, so you can just cold call them and say, hey, you know, who is the president of the board or the executive director and say, hey, I've got this skill set. Is that something you think would be interesting to you? Usually nine times out of 10, they're, they're going to find a spot for you to volunteer or to help out. Maybe not in the technology area, but maybe in another area that you find equally interesting. Okay, that's some great tips. Mm -hmm. So you heard it here. She just gave you another <laughs> gem. If you're thinking about getting and expanding your skill set, go out there and cold call those volunteering groups. You yeah. mentioned, um, Evelyn, that you enjoy reading. So Absolutely. What, what are some of the books that you would encourage the listeners to read or some that you just want to share? Yeah, I think uh, there's three books that I wanted to share, and I'll just make it out because I want to get the authors correct. The first one is uh, is an actual science fiction book. And the reason that I'm going to recommend it is not because it's science fiction, because that's not my sweet spot of reading. Um, but that is The Sparrow by a woman named Mary Doria Russell. Mm -hmm. And the reason that it's interesting is because it's the unintended consequences when a group of people from Earth go to another planet and the assumptions that they make about how things should be on this other planet. Mm -hmm. So it's really, I just have to be a little bit careful because it's not a, it's not a PG book, right? Okay. It's, 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 it's got a little bit of an R element to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I want to uh, be cautious with that recommendation. It's, it's a, mm -hmm. definitely an adult, uh, sophisticated book to read. But okay. what's interesting about that is the concept of what things we inherently assume we don't even question <laughs> that we maybe should take a step back and think about before we proceed thinking we know how things should work and how things should be. And I think for that reason, it's one of those books that is really compelling. The second one is a book called Stones from the River by a woman named Ursula Heige, H-E-G-I. Mm -hmm. And it's about a dwarf in the, um, and that's the language that they use, in the Nazi Germany time frame. And what the story revolves around, it's, it's, it's a long book and it's a little bit complicated to explain the plot, but the point of the book and the reason I thought to bring it here was mm -hmm. it talks about a woman who is clearly overlooked in this period of time and yet brings these amazing differentiated skills to the table that prove to be very valuable. And the reason I chose it for this conversation is because I think sometimes people say, I don't have anything special. I don't have anything of value that I can bring to the table. I'm just whatever, like everyone else. And the reality is we really always all have something we bring to the table. It doesn't have to be unique in all the world. It just has to be something that you bring to the table with passion, with positive, with energy. And I think that's where people need to read a story about somebody who really was uh, not considered to be of value in that environment and, in fact, was able to be a contributor. And because she was different, she saw things in a different way. And then the last one is probably the most complicated book I have ever read, and that is Ulysses by James Joyce. And I decided I was going to read it. It is a 24-hour period of the life of a person um, in in Ireland, and the author, who is a genius in the in the English world, uh, English speaking world, decides to write each of these chapters in a different style. And one of the chapters is probably just maybe twenty or twenty eight pages long, and it has one period in it. So it's one 
or two to really, really long sentences. And it's just unbelievable. Very difficult to read. But what I did is I decided I was going to read that. I gathered a group of people and I said, hey, are you up for a challenge? It's kind of the Mount Everest of, of reading. And I said, let's meet over a year to read one chapter each. And we would discuss it. And most of us would say, I don't know what happened. We had to get a study guide to help us understand what we were reading. But the reality is those people became a group that I continue to read books with. And we laugh because we have this shared experience where we graduated from James Joyce Ulysses. Now we read other great big books. And so it created a new group for me of people that I wouldn't necessarily have met or had uh, time or been engaged with over a longer period of time. And we've been going for, I think, seven years now. So it's been great. We read books together and it, it's been a fun and interesting and challenging uh, book to read. So yeah. I might not recommend that as a solo reading exercise, but as a reading exercise, I think it's great as a way to maybe engage in your community and maybe make new friends. And I'll make sure to put all of those three book recommendations down in the um, YouTube comments. Great. So make sure y'all go click on there, get these books, learn it. So Evelyn, we had a great conversation and I want to make sure the, con the conversation continues. How can my audience contact you? Absolutely. I'd love to hear from them. My email is the best way to contact me and it's Evelyn Zabo. Let me spell that for you. E, V as in Victor, E, L, Y, N, Last name Zabo, Z is in zebra, A, B is in boy, O. So Evelyn Zabo at hotmail.com. Of course, you can find me on Twitter as well with the same handle. And so I look forward to both hearing from them and ideally from you as well. It's been a delight talking with you. Likewise, and I make sure to put all that information on the bottom and I include your LinkedIn profile. Great. So make sure that you send her a message and tell her why you're trying to reach out to her. Tell her that you found her from here. So then you can start actually cultivating a relationship. But Evelyn and Sly Gittins are out <laughs> and we'll talk to you later. Thank you.